Hello and welcome to another episode of CNBC's Beyond the Valley. I'm Arjun Karpal here in London. Now, it may be hot in other parts of the world, but it's pretty cold in the world of cryptocurrencies. Uh, the the industry is going through uh, what they dub at the moment as a so-called crypto winter. This is a period of uh, depressed prices, a bear market. But how exactly did we get here? Because it was just in November where the cryptocurrency market was uh, around a $3 trillion market capitalization. And since then, to the start of August, about $1.9 trillion of value has been wiped out. Now, we have been here before, back in 2017, 2018. We have seen those past cycles, but this time it is different. And we're going to dig into why in this episode of Beyond the Valley with a very interesting guest. Now, I do kind of want to give you a bit of an overview, at least the start of of some of the factors at play here before we dig a bit more into them. And firstly, the macroeconomic factors have been uh, quite a, a, a big uh, pressure really on on why we've seen these these prices come down in the crypto market you've had uh, inflation at some uh, extremely uh, high points and the central banks around the world have had to uh, increase interest rates to deal with that we've seen a negative impact on risk assets such as the stock market and often one thing we have seen is how uh, cryptocurrencies have have been quite closely correlated to the movement of stock markets and that's why one of the reasons you've seen the market come down but actually, this time round, macro factors, yes, they, they are one, one aspect of it. But also, there have been some very specific issues in the industry um, as well. And it started really with the collapse of, of a so-called algorithmic stablecoin called Terra USD and its sister token, Luna. You may have heard uh, about this or read a bit about what happened here as well. Now, a stablecoin is a type of cryptocurrency that's supposed to be pegged one-to-one -one with another asset. Uh, in the case of Terra USD, it was supposed to be pegged one-to-one uh, -to -one with the US dollar. Um, and it was governed by an algorithm, but it failed to keep that dollar peg and, and eventually collapsed. And we're going to dig into exactly the mechanics and the mechanisms be behind exactly what happened uh, as well. This time around, there has also been a high level of borrowing or, or leverage uh, that traders and investors have been using to trade the markets as well. People have been borrowing money from various sources, uh, putting them on trades that haven't quite worked out. And that's put more pressure on the market. And that has also led to the bankruptcy of a company called Three Arrows Capital or 3AC, another high profile victim of this latest crypto winter, which you might have heard about as well. We're going to dig into exactly what happened there. And finally, there were a lot of business models uh, that were tested. Uh, we saw uh, lenders, for example, Celsius, another company you may have heard of file for bankruptcy because they were offering uh, users extremely high yields or, or interest payments of around nearly 19% if users deposited their crypto with Celsius. But in the back, they were perhaps engaging in some pretty risky activities in order to be able to get the money in order to pay back these yields. So there, there was a lot going on there. And again, we're going to dig in uh, to these stories around Celsius, around Three Arrows Capital, and some of the other issues in the crypto market as well. And there are clearly a lot of differences between the 2020 bust and crypto winter we've seen and what we've seen in previous cycles as well. And to dig into that, uh, I'm pleased to say I'm joined by Carol Alexander, Professor of Finance at the University of Sussex, to, to dig into these topics. Carol, thanks so much for joining me on Beyond the Valley. Thank you for inviting me, Arjun. Good to be here. Uh, so let's just kick off then with, with a sort of broad overview of What's different or what are the main differences about this sort of crypto boom and crash we've seen uh, in the year 2022 versus what we saw in the previous cycle in 2017, 2018? Well, there's quite a few differences, actually. I suppose the main two are that there are a lot more complex products and services. There weren't any derivatives back in 2017, apart from a few what we call perpetual swaps, but nothing much to speak of. Um, and the presence of very sophisticated traders was absent in um, 2017. Um, there was no DeFi at all, the sort of decentralized where everything happens on blockchains 
in 2017. And, and the market cap of the entire crypto market was about um, uh, 500 uh, billion in 2017. Um, and now, or just before the crash, the total market cap was 3 trillion, of which um, the DeFi alone accounted for 500 billion. So there was a lot more DeFi. And then, of course, there were so many other coins and tokens that could be affected. So it was a real broad market. What we call CeFi and DeFi have both been affected. So, Carol, let's just dig into this a little bit more and get under the skin of exactly how the crypto market uh, got to where we were are how this crash happened uh, and it really happened or it, the catalyst for it was the collapse of of a so-called algorithmic stable coin called uh, Terra USD and its sister token Luna. Now uh, just before I sort of ask you to run us through that I'll quickly explain and our audience can can listen to the last episode of the Beyond the Valley to learn a lot more about stable coins but really stable coins are these type of cryptocurrency that are supposed to be pegged one to one with another asset uh, in the case of something like Tether and USDC it was it's they're supposed to be pegged one to one with the US dollar and these companies uh, the companies behind these uh, uh, stable coins claim that they have the reserves in the back uh, to back up this claim and to be able to to uphold that one to one peg but an algorithmic stable coin such as Terra USD is different um, and so, Carol, just explain to us exactly what Terra Luna is, uh, how it eventually collapsed and, and how that did uh, you'd be the catalyst, become the catalyst for, for the market downturn we've seen. Yes, Terra Luna are two, two coins, um, like the Earth and the Sun. And Terra is the stable coin. Actually, it's a whole class of stable coins. And Luna is a cryptocurrency that can be uh, traded on centralized exchanges. And the idea behind this algorithmic state stable coin was to build the idea of arbitrage into the rules of the Terra blockchain. Because actually, um, Tether and USDC, Circles Coin, and they don't keep their peg against the dollar because they're fully collateralized. In fact, there's been some doubt about that in the past, at least. That they keep their peg against the dollar through very active arbitrage. Robots are operating on centralized exchanges. And as soon as there's a little deviation of the price, they'll either buy or sell the stable coin against the dollar. For example, on Kraken, there's a, a perpetual that they, they could use to do that. So there's a very active arbitrage going on, which is quite old fashioned and uh, quite expensive. Whereas the idea of Terra was to build arbitrage of a different type into the blockchain. So that um, it, it, the arbitrage works not through buying and selling, but through supply and demand. And if the demand is fixed, if the supply is more, then the price goes down. Okay, so if you supply more, you reduce the price. And the idea is to supply more of one and burn, actually reduce the supply of the other. So if you supply more Terra, then you reduce the supply of Luna. So if you supply more, more Terra, then the price of Terra will go down and the price of Luna will go up. That's the idea anyway. But the problem is that um, there's these liquidity pools that's, which were attacked. And it wasn't the blockchain, it was the actual liquidity pools. Now, what would the particular liquidity pool called the curve liquidity pool? That's a, there's lots of liquidity pools. That's how all the trading happens on DeFi. It's in swapping in liquidity pools. It's completely different to the sort of trading we've got in traditional markets. So it's quite difficult for my students to understand, actually. But anyway, back to liquidity pools. The idea is to... Um, uh, make the price according to how much liquidity or how many coins there are of each. So if you want to trade Terra against Tether, then if there's lots of Terra and very little Tether, then the price of Tether will go up because it's rarer. Okay, so the lower the liquidity, the higher the price. So what happened was that some unknown wallets withdrew all the Terra liquidity from the curve pool, thus forcing the Terra price to go right up and the Luna price to 
to fall right down. And that same unidentified wallet very possibly had put a large short position on Luna on one of these centralised exchanges and then cashed in when Luna collapsed. So all of that was withdrawn. And what impact then did that have on you know the subsequent coins? Because we saw effectively Luna go to zero. We saw uh, Terra USD uh, massively lose its $1 peg. It fell significantly below that. Um, so what was the, the chain event that, that then led to that? It was the withdrawal of the liquidity. That was the main thing. So once the um, liquidity was withdrawn, the algorithm went crazy. It said the Terra price is going up and up, so we must mint more and more and more Luna. So that's what. And then once that once Luna had collapsed, Terra had to collapse because they were in symbiosis. And we know that there were a lot of players in the market who had exposure to Luna and to Terra. Um, one of those was was the. Uh, a hedge fund Three Arrows Capital, which we'll come on to in a moment. But there was another high pro- profile victim of this uh, latest crypto winter, and that was Celsius, this this crypto lending platform that were promising um, users, retail investors, a very high yield, almost as high as 19%, uh, if they deposited their crypto with Celsius. Um, now, Celsius sort of ended up... Uh, um, loaning that crypto that they got from customers out to other players in the market in order to get a higher yield to then give to their customers. So that was basically the business model. Um, but Celsius has recently declared bankruptcy. Uh, so so what happened there? Well, I suppose the root cause was, again, the what we call the anchor protocol. You see, in order to incentivize people to want to hold terror, in fact, its capitalization grew exponentially. Um, the, uh, it, part of the um, whole blockchain protocol was something called Anchor, which was a bit like Celsius. It was a borrowing lending platform. And at one point, it was offering 19% yields for people that used it, which was more than Celsius. So Celsius had to, had to offer higher and higher yields to compete with Anchor. And it ended up... I think offering over 18.5% in yields. And it wasn't making those back. It had really highly risky investments. So it was already sort of failing because it couldn't pay those yields. It was using its own capital. I mean, it was managing about, I think, 12 billion of depositors' funds. So it's, as I said, borrowing lending platforms. So people deposit that, they get the high yields at about 12, but they were managing them in very, very highly risky investments. And then it had made loans to other counterparties, about eight billion as well. But that 12 billion of depositors' funds, um, very little of it was in anything relatively stable. But they did have quite a lot in, in stable coins, including Terra. But it, anyway, it lost about 100 million on ter- Terra. But once it started losing, um, people started withdrawing their funds, and, and that's when it collapsed. So it was almost sort of the 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 crypto equivalent almost of of a kind of bank run. Everyone rushing to get their cash out of out of Celsius, and then we saw the company end up pausing withdrawals um, for users at some point to try to halt this. But 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 the damage was done at that point, um, and we'd seen some contagion that by then across some of the market, right? Oh, yes, particularly Three Arrows Capital. I mean, that was huge. Well, let's move on to Three Arrows then, because this was a hedge fund focused on crypto, known for extremely bullish views on the industry. Uh, It was known for borrowing very heavily um, from others in order to fuel uh, some of these sort of bets it was making on the market. And I think Three Arrows Capital is a great one to highlight in terms of this cycle and the nature of borrowing or, or leverage, uh, as it's also known. Um, so just run us through what happened to Three Arrows Capital, or 3AC, as it was also known, that effectively led to its demise and, and to the fact that it had to file for bankruptcy. Yeah. Well, remember at the beginning of this podcast, I said the two main things that are different were the complex products and services and also very sophisticated players. So I'm not sure Three Arrows Capital knew what they were doing as much as some of these TradFi, um, really sophisticated Wall Street, you know, the real gorillas of Wall Street are now 
being able to, to trade on, on crypto because there's no regulation. And, you know, they, they'll do um, the spoofing, layering and all the sort of price manipulation strategies that they would be put in jail for if they did it on the CME or anywhere else. Um, they can do that. And I just think Three Arrows Capital just was, wasn't streetwise enough to be able to compete with them. Um, and then there are all these uh, very complex products, huge leverage. That's another thing. In TradFi, you know, the margins are quite high, so you can't take more than about two or three times leverage. Um, whereas in some of these self-regulated markets, you can have a hundred times leverage, and you are responsible also for maintaining your collateral. You don't get a margin call or anything like that. You're just wiped out completely. And this has happened a lot, and Three Arrows Capital were, were not excluded from that type of um, automatic liquidation, we call them, by exchanges. And they'd also got involved in the DeFi that didn't exist back in 2017, you know, but they'd borrowed, I don't know, people say between 200 and 500 million Luna, which they lost completely. And then they also borrowed from Voyager Digital, which was another one, a platform a bit like Celsius, that, that went bankrupt. So, so three AC really you, you're sort of painting a picture of of one where, you know, they made a lot of investments that effectively they were on the wrong side of. A lot of trades were on the wrong side of. They used a lot of debt to to fuel that, uh, and so so called high leverage, uh, and and the market downturn to some extent happened so swiftly that I felt like there were many players. Celsius and Three Arrows Capital that that just got caught wrong footed, off guard by. Is that a, is that a fair way to sort of assess some of these stories we've been speaking about so far? Well, yes. I mean, it started. I think May the over the weekend, as always, of course. <laughs> um, Saturday and Sunday was when the the first um, withdrawals of liquidity from from the curve pool started. Um, and then the big crash came on, I think it was Wednesday the 10th of May, I remember, because I was on a retreat at the time. <laughs> Didn't really want to uh, talk to anyone about it, but it was very, very rapid indeed. Um, and uh, the thing is that what was happening was so complex that it wasn't until about a few weeks later that we really understood it. So, Carol, when you look at what's happened lately in the uh, in the market, um, are there any comparisons yet to be made uh, with uh, any of the practices or, or issues we saw during the great financial crisis? Yes, there's a lot of parallels in terms of unintended economic bombs, I think is how I would summarise it. See, what happened in um, 2008 was there was a huge credit boom created by very, very low interests uh, and interest rates. And, and that, um, that deprived banks of their normal business, so obviously they sought yield elsewhere. If they can't get interests on the loans they make, which is what banks are supposed to do, then um, what else can they do? But So they created these, I won't go into a lot of detail because we haven't seen these products yet in crypto. Crypto is just thinking out of the box, you know, it's creating all these products that we've never seen before in TradFi because mostly computer scientists are in charge, at least have been. But anyway, so these toxic toxic um, collateralized debt obligations and the um, credit default swaps on top of these were um, bundled up and exported from the US to the European economy and, and basically blasted it and it hasn't recovered since. Not to the same extent as it, I mean, it was really competing with the US in 2008. Uh, and and one of the things we did see in the wake of of the financial crisis was, of course, a much bigger focus on on regulations, um, on the banking sector in particular. And so, when we look at, at the crypto world now, in you know, a lot of conversations I've had recently as well, what does this latest uh, series of events mean for regulation in the market? And you know, the industry says, well, we are expecting more regulation. We just need it to be thoughtful. Um, and 
we're working with regulators, etc. That's that's the industry view. The regulators, on the other hand, are sort of um, talking a lot uh, about about crypto regulation and saying we want to do it, we need to do it. And I'm not very impressed with what's been happening in the US. You know, there's the SEC, the CFTC, the Department of Justice, the New York State Attorney. And, you know, there's been 35 bills proposed by senators just this session (laughs) on who should regulate crypto in the US. And then in, the, in Europe, we've got this market for um, market infrastructure for crypto assets bill, um, which should be rolled out in 2024. But um, there's a lot of doubt about whether the people are in place that can understand it and actually roll it out. And then it's got some pretty, pretty severe ideas in there, like the volume transacted on stable coins in total can't exceed 200 million euros a day, which is tiny. I mean, the the trading volume in Coinbase is around 1.3 billion at the moment per day. So, you know, if stable coins can't exceed that, what's going to happen, of course, is that the self-regulated exchanges aren't going to comply with that. And we'll have more and more people moving to jurisdictions that are crypto-friendly, a sort of regulatory arbitrage. Um, but the, the most worrying thing, really, is the general lack of expertise that regulators have. They're so behind the curve, and the learning curve gets steeper all the time. Carol, thanks so much for that fascinating insight. Really appreciate all your comments. and Thanks so much for joining me today on Beyond the Valley. Good to speak to you. That was a, a really interesting conversation that painted a, a, a big picture. I think one of the themes that underlined that uh, and why some of these behaviours and practices were in play in the crypto market is the fact that there is such a lack of regulation. Um, it is still a very unregulated market, and that's why you are seeing some of these business practices come through. But there was this picture painted of uh, a, a, an industry in which there was lack of risk management. There was sort of overzealousness uh, in many places uh, as well. Uh, and that led to risky activities and ultimately contagion. Uh, across the market. And now we're in a a situation where investors, where traders are looking forward, wondering what the catalyst is for any kind of leg higher uh, in the crypto markets, a return potentially to all time highs. But also you've got the regulators honing in now on the industry, figuring out how best to regulate uh, cryptocurrencies and and things like stable coins as well. And I think that's going to be a fascinating conversation. Look, I'd love to hear what you all listening and watching uh, have to say, have to think about some of the topics we've addressed today. You can contact me directly on Twitter at Arjun Karpal. Uh, But that's it for now for another episode of CNBC's Beyond the Valley. Thanks for listening and watching, and we'll catch you next time. Beyond the Valley.